What is the point of all those push-ups if you can't even lift a bloody log? baby let's take the term assessment in the very general sense of seeing whether something works this would encapsulate assessing students knowledge to see if learning is occurring this is what we typically think of when we hear testing assessing abilities to see if they're improving this is typically called aptitude testing the wide-ranging achievement test from lecture three being one example and assessing teaching methods curriculum content or even our assessment methods to see if they're appropriate to motivate us, the ultimate goal of a liberal education, or the liberal arts in general, was, and hopefully still is, to make students into competent and critical judges of their own work and thoughts, to make them competent and free to empower and improve themselves. Since the world and its demands on us change, we need habits that can give us the abilities and the freedom to adapt and understand. This can be encapsulated in three habits. This first habit is a creating of work, which the student can then judge and improve. He needs something to work on. One of the reasons we know so much about history from the last century or two is that educated people kept diaries and journals. They documented their lives in order to help themselves understand them. Not to get likes, views, or social attention or approval, but to comprehend their lives through iteration, documentation, and rough drafts of their thoughts and their meaning. The educated individual is in dialogue with herself. This is where the second habit of an educated person, judging what one creates, becomes important. One writes things down to understand them, to determine and to judge one's private description, representation, or depiction of things in terms of its clarity, consistency, reasonableness, and logical coherence, applying the basic rules of grammar and logic, making sure one is not reasoning circularly, contradicting oneself, using the same word to mean two different things, appealing or deferring to authority, reasoning by analogy, or obscuring a lack of knowledge in the use of ill-defined words or unclear descriptions. A metaphor I use for this is finding out what's in one's bucket. Words, especially polysyllable ones, can contain many different meanings. Often we're not aware of all the meaning we're carrying in a given word, or that it is devoid of meaning sometimes, aside from some emotional association. Finding out what meaning an author is carrying in or conveying in a given word, or bucket, is referred to as coming to terms with that author and writing with judgment is a process of coming to terms with oneself, finding out what one means or has meant by words. This is a description of how writing is not just expressing, but finding out what one thinks, so that one can then evaluate and improve not just the communication, but the quality of one's thoughts according to one's own standards. Writing is the discovery, sometimes of empty buckets and sometimes of ones so full that one finds oneself inside of them. With this judging habit installed, one can then move with little effort to improving oneself and others through dialogue with those others. Someone who engaged in dialogue used to be called a man of letters, that is, someone who corresponds regularly with others, attempting to clarify topics through thoughtful private discussion with those others. The audience of the other person being a motivator to improve one's clarity and the utility of one's thoughts. Note that even as one expands from writing for oneself to writing privately with others to producing work for employers and broader audiences, the most important audience, judge, and critic is always oneself, without high personal standards for clarity, logic, and cogency, expanding to other audiences will not be successful or beneficial to oneself or others. If you cannot understand me, or what I am saying could mean too many different things, then our dialogue will not be a clarifying, improving, or empowering one. We could still signal to each other that we agree or emotionally support each other, but even this would be hollow, since we're not sure what we agree on or support. Solidarity without some solidity is the protection of nothing but our own ignorance. If you have ever received feedback or comments from a friend or TA or professor that you didn't understand, or that avoided stating anything specific, you've experienced how useless dialogue without clarity is. 
Not every encounter with other humans that we have needs to improve our grasp and use of the truth, but we should be capable of creating and parsing those encounters, of expressing things clearly to others so that they can learn from us and of us, and learning from the expressions of others. It is in the requirements of formal schooling that we produce work, learn standards to judge it, and share in this process with capable others. It is here that we see the vestiges, or more hopefully the seeds, of an actual liberal education. By nearly all accounts, formal schooling fails to turn school requirements into the three habits. And accounts differ as to why, from poor institutional memory, addiction to diversion and avoidance of work, to conspiracy and oppression by design. But we can hopefully at least see what the original intentions were, and that regardless of how the formal school structures designed to instill the three habits are failing to instill them, the habits are still the core of being an educated, free, self-developing person. Now, it is entirely possible here to say, contrarily, that someone capable of creating things, employing standards to judging and improving what they produced, and engaging in the process of creation and improvement with others is not educated. I would invite anyone capable of creating a better idea of what being educated means to submit that better idea to judgment through dialogue to see whether he can educate us as to what is missing. Note here that there are a few levels to this discussion. First, assessment in education is ideally for instilling these habits in individuals, developing judgment, for example. Second, the assessment of education is ideally assessing whether these habits have been instilled. And third, we're often interested in which means of instruction have been most successful in instilling these habits. Note that content has not been abandoned. It may seem like we're in abstract territory here, but assessing whether content has been learned has not been abandoned, since creating or comprehending anything requires content, and for that content, those facts, to be correct. The liberal arts focus, or to mix metaphors, its overarching purpose, is on developing capacities that work as content changes, regardless of what field one happens to be in. Hopefully, this framework is clear enough and motivating enough to make what follows both coherent and justified. I made it, and to the best of my judgment, it should be useful for developing your own understanding. Let's start with assessment of learning. We know, for example, that intro psychology courses do not lastingly teach students much of anything. There are plenty of powerful examples, like the fact that four months after an intro course, students who took the course answer about as many questions about the content correctly as students who never took the course. Giving students who passed their final exam that same exam months later is as likely to result in the student failing as passing it. And this is just giving students the type of tests that they prepped for. The results get much more depressing when some actual transfer or application of learning is tested. Here is Nobel Prize winning psychologist Dan Kahneman stating that teaching psychology is mostly a waste of time. Why? It's not because we forget the things we learn. It's actually worse than that. For the month or so that we do have the knowledge, it has no impact on us. We don't apply it. In this example, students learned that only 4 out of 15 participants helped someone in distress, and were asked to predict whether or not two specific participants helped. A control group of students who did not know the base rate, i.e. who were not told how low the helping base rate was, performed just as well at prediction as the people who had the knowledge. That is, both groups predicted nearly every time that the participants helped. Knowing the low helping base rate did not influence the students' predictions. What good is this short-lived knowledge if all it does is help us answer multiple choice questions? If we know it, but don't incorporate it into our decisions and behavior, then it's hard to argue with Kahneman's conclusion that despite knowing the fact, we have, quote, learned nothing at all, end quote. And this is just one example of what might be labeled, in educational psych jargon, a failure of near transfer. I will put the challenge to you more directly. If you study psychology and do not use it to better yourself, to change the habits and thoughts you do not like, to set and meet higher standards for yourself, then you are wasting your time. Maybe you are also getting a shiny participation degree, but you're also wasting your time. 
Nobody can force you to see what is in front of you. Those in the arts tend to believe that it takes time with great and difficult literature to accomplish seeing what is in front of us. But nobody can see for you. Moving from facts to learning is up to you. Otherwise, you are counting on the best psychology professors to trick you into learning something, often using the same biases that we're warning you against, like overgeneralizing from small samples. Look, a case study that shows how foolish someone was for being convinced by just a case study. Are you skeptical of case studies yet? Anyway, back to the bye-bye intro paper. Students do not even seem to reliably develop in a four-year psychology degree beliefs about psychology that are more correct than the general public. And this is not because psychology is common sense. It is because these students retain incorrect beliefs or understandings. Douglas Bernstein suggests focusing only on a few common incorrect beliefs for an entire intro to psych course. Here is his suggested list for a term. I would add the idea of learning styles to this, but maybe we'll come back to that at a later time. Continuing with the assessment of learning, you may be familiar with the concept of grade inflation. Grade inflation refers to higher grades being awarded for the same, or worse, work. Here's William Derezowitz discussing grade inflation in elite U.S. schools. In 1960, the average GPA at private universities was about a 2.5. In 1990, it was about a 3.1. In 2007, it was 3.3. And at highly selective private schools, 3.43. Given the rate at which the numbers have been rising, the last figure is probably over 3.5 by now. The closer the curve gets squeezed to the ceiling, the harder it is to make distinctions, and the less incentive students have to do their best. In 1940, 15% of grades fell within the A range. In 2008, the number was almost 45%. Here is what the 1960s and 2008 distributions look like superimposed. According to Pierce, most employers check GPAs of recent graduates and expect these GPAs to indicate the quality of hires. But grade inflation is making GPA meaningless, prompting him to call for the stanching of the hemorrhaging of collegiate GPA credibility. This paper notes that grade inflation is nearly everywhere, with university departments that do not grant PhDs having higher averages, but just as much inflation since 1985. The worst grade inflation is in English departments, and the only sizable negative inflation is in psychology departments, which is where the people who know how to assess people are. More to the point, psychology departments are where the people who know the value of multiple choice questions are. The value of multiple choice questions, you say? I thought we were all agreed that multiple choice does not assess real learning. Well, regardless of how you feel about it, multiple choice assessment does something that essay graders seem increasingly unwilling or incapable of doing. Differentiate performance. Here is an example of a nursing program that needed to stanch the hemorrhaging of credibility because 90% of students were getting A's. What was their revised format that changed their everyone gets A's distribution to an actual normal curve? They switched from written answers to multiple choice, at least partially. Now, an A means something again in this program. We can stop here before we look at Canada and Ontario specifically and ask why grade inflation is such a problem. The trouble here is that there are too many good answers to this question, such as grading being done by TAs and short-term workers who need good student reviews in order to get rehired, the university being run more like a business or a service where the customer is always right and can take their business elsewhere or select another institution that gives higher grades for less work, and and then there's the general fact that student life bureaucrats student life bureaucrats and so-called social scientists now see harm in struggle, virtue in comfort, and young adults as fragile children. I find it disturbing that people who study development for a living would gaslight university students by telling them they are not yet adults and should be avoiding anxiety. Someone who tells you this is not your friend. They're signaling that they either cannot or do not have your best interests in mind. They're asking you to spend your peak years of health and fluid intelligence, years you'll never get back, in a state of dependence and fear, living down to the worst expectations and being protected from self-improvement. To learn judgment 
or have dialogue, we need both of those things. And not to be told that we are incapable of or should be scared of them. Get some. Transcend yourself. Your school grades and feedback have likely not been enough to help you. They've likely avoided bad news and hurting your feelings or making you complain by essentially withholding judgment. And this likely started before high school, but let's start at high school in our analysis. Alberta is the province with the lowest rates of high school grade inflation in part because final grades are partially determined by standardized, anonymously graded final exams. That said, nearly three times more social studies students receive A's on teacher-graded portions of their grade than on their standardized portion. As in the universities, the highest inflation is in English. Now, there's more empirically supporting grade inflation than just a difference between teacher grades and standardized grades, but let's review some basic psychological observable effects of grade inflation on students. Lower expectations, lower achievement scores, usually explained by demotivation, inaccurate feedback, since A doesn't actually mean A, less within student differentiation, I improved and still got an A, so what exactly am I good at? Less learning, preparedness, reduced study time, false self-esteem, which as we know should be evidence-based, less accountability of teachers and schools, and not just less high-end differentiation, A's not meaning A's, but also less low-end differentiation. What used to be an F, now being a C-. British Columbia has the second lowest grade inflation rates. For BC, we'll look at failure rates. Nearly four times as many students fail the standardized test for applied math as fail the teacher-graded classroom portion. You would think with math that the standardized results would be closer to what the teachers are saying. But once again, Grade inflation is highest for English class. 11 times more students fail the provincial test than the teacher graded portion of the grade 12 English First Peoples class. Maybe this just means that the exams are too hard, but the exam results have been staying the same. It is the classroom grades that have been rising. The standardized assessments are tethered to international norms. We can't change those and lower expectations the way we can in the classroom. What's noted here is that in just one year, classroom averages increased by 6%. And this is an average across a province. It was mentioned that Alberta has the lowest grade inflation in Canada and we can quantify this in terms of the average drop in grades from high school to university. If you're a student from BC, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, or Ontario, you can expect your average in university to be around 19.6% lower than your average was in high school. If you are a student from Alberta, you can expect your average in university to be only 6.4% lower than your average in high school. This is the relative advantage of having been schooled in Alberta and subject to comparatively less grade inflation. And that 19.6% number lumped together BC, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. Things are much better in BC than in Ontario. McGill University, for example, has revealed that it lowers the averages of applicants from Ontario high schools by 7% in recognition that grade inflation is especially terrible in Ontario. The title of Jim Duick's book comes from his observation that high school grade inflation in Canada mostly favors female students. In other words, the inflation of teacher assessments versus exams is greater for females than males, with more females who did not get A's on exams getting A's from teachers, and more males who passed exams getting failed by teachers. This is a common enough observation that it has made it into psychology of gender textbooks as an example of benevolent sexism, teachers giving higher grades and less feedback especially less negative feedback to female students. The males who receive that negative feedback, or criticism, are thus given an advantage in terms of the liberal arts development that we've been discussing. In women's studies departments, the argument that criticism, grading, rules, and even grammar are the oppressive master's tools is sometimes made explicit and has been likely preventing plenty of student growth. But this point has actually already been made. 
What I would add is that this prophecy of criticism, that it is oppressive, could be self-fulfilled. If a student believes me when I tell them that criticism is designed to crush them rather than to nurture their growth and judgment, then they're more likely to experience a feeling of being crushed, to react against criticism, not take it to heart, and therefore not benefit from it. One little change of frame here can destroy what little was left of the judgment-nurturing aspect of liberal education for the now oppressed student that I have thusly enlightened. So how should criticism be framed? As follows. Criticism is given under the assumption that you could have done better. Internalizing this assumption that you can get better is a key part of developing your own judgment and using this judgment to repeatedly level yourself up. Judgment is a crane that raises bigger ones. Criticism is something that encourages this judgment crane. Great inflation is effectively the reduction of such encouragement. It is a sizable and ubiquitous problem. A C grade in the UK in the 1980s was apparently equivalent to an A grade in 2009. An argument put forward by Duick at this point is that only reference to some standard or standards will stop grade inflation. Not wanting to bring IQ-style aptitude tests into the mix, many of us might prefer a return to standards of judgment. Who would help provide those? Teachers? The same teachers who all went to teachers' college programs with such absurd grade inflation that, quote, marks below a B seldom occur and failure is virtually non-existent? Not surprisingly, employers and universities are unhappy with the quality of high school graduates and the lack of credibility of grades that grade inflation has caused. But we'll return to this at the level of higher education. What we need to do now is to go deeper than just testing for subject learning, since this learning gets forgotten anyway, to assessing change in ability. Does higher education improve our ability to think, solve problems, and work with or convey ideas? Grades seem inadequate to the task of assessing this question in any broad sense, since grades can differ between classes, schools, and terms for reasons that have nothing to do with individual learning or ability. Your having entered Wellesley College after the introduction of their anti-grade inflation policy means that your grades are lower, not that your abilities are lower. Put another way, grades or rubrics are not standardized across classes, subjects, instructors, and schools the way that IQ tests are. The standardization of IQ tests on census-stratified samples of entire countries make them the high watermark not just of assessing intellectual ability, but of assessment in general, and of the measurement of psychological variables in general. So why not use IQ tests to assess whether school has improved ability? First, it's useful to remind ourselves that IQ tests are normed or standardized by age, so that a given score is compared to other scores of people the same age. The age bands on the WISC, the Wessler Intelligence Scale for Children, for example, are in increments or bands of three months. So a child who is six years and three months old who takes the test is compared to a different norm sample than a child who is six years and four months old. If you take the test at age seven and at age nine, any development you do in that time will only show up as a difference if it is development over and above whatever development naturally happens or happens on average between the age of seven and nine. Yes, you grew but so did everyone else, so did the norm set. You do not get credit for the growing that you did that the norm set also did. In this way, with in-person IQ test differences, comparing you then to you now will only assess improvement relative to the average. You can do a lot of self-improving and still see your score go down if your amount of self-improvement is less than the average amount. So this is a good reason for not using IQ tests to assess personal learning or changes to one's personal ability. But there's another issue here, which is specificity. Your improvement may have come from the abstracting benefits of having learned calculus, while someone else's came from learning word definitions. In short, IQ tests are almost too good at reliably measuring general ability. This is good because it means they are robust and predictive, and we need this reliability in various applications, though we should note here that this reliability only exists once grade school gets going. The reliability for IQ tests before ages six or seven is embarrassingly low. Only a quarter of kindergartners assessed as gifted can be expected to stay in the gifted range. But once we have some grade school experience, the approximate rule for IQ tests is that a gap of one year, sometimes shortened to six months, is enough to 
reduce practice effects or improvement due to just having experienced the test, such that your score shouldn't be more than five points different. This has all been very precisely quantified. These are the test-retest reliabilities here for the WISC-4. Note that none of the group means are decreasing, so upon retest, even with the year or longer gap, we should expect only some increase as a result of having been tested previously. With this in mind, let's return to our question. Why not use IQ tests to assess whether school has improved ability? One response is that the assessment is too general. What IQ assesses, things like verbal comprehension and detection of abstract similarities between things, is more general and abstract than can he synthesize research into an argument and conclusion, which is the more mid-level and less abstract or general type of ability or socially relevant behavior that an employer or project partner might want to know about. In other words, an IQ test might be like picking teams for basketball based on height. Yes, the taller kids might have more general potential advantage for rebounding and shooting under the net, but do they play? Have they worked on the more specific aspects of their game? A shorter player who practices these things will run circles around the taller player who does not. Height advantage, actual intelligence, is real, but not necessarily most relevant. Someone who argues that IQ tests also do a good job of assessing the desired specific abilities, or mid-abilities, could be countered by results like those of Watkins and company, who found that the contributions of the factors, the mid-abilities, were not as predictive of test performance as the original Weschler researchers had thought. That is, the predictively useful bit of an IQ test is the general IQ score. In our metaphor, the overall height measure, not the sub-factors of the IQ test. Analogizing to height, though, might be misleading, since one can't change one's height. So a reminder is due here that IQ is malleable. With our expectable 1 to 5 point IQ gain per year of education and the results from this adoption study, which showed that between age 4 or 5 and age 14 or 15, borderline IQ children gained 8 IQ points on average if adopted into low socioeconomic status households, 16 IQ points on average if adopted into mid-level socioeconomic status households, and 19.5 IQ points on average if adopted into high socioeconomic status households. It does change, but it doesn't change much, and it doesn't do a good job of telling us what has changed. The other response to the question, why not use IQ tests to assess whether school has improved ability, is that despite their ability to predict success, IQ tests might be measuring test-taking ability, or how skillful one is in taking abstract tests more than the relevant task performance. This is, to me, the best criticism of or argument against the interpretation of the Flynn effect as us getting smarter. Maybe we're just better at taking tests. The precise problem here is that the aspect of the test we are improving upon might be the aspect least relevant to the specific abilities needed for performance outside of the tests. Yes, you can hit 9 out of 10 shots from the free throw line. Bullets in the bullseye. And yes, free throw shooting is relevant. But can you dribble? The game is not just free throws, not just abstract problems. There's more to it, and having perfected free throws, test writing, is only maybe predictive of other relevant skills. What I would like to add before moving away from IQ tests is that they are, despite a history of people misusing them, the least biased estimator of ability and potential that we have. This is a big claim, so let's support it first on the test end, the psychometric end. First. The tests are standardized on census stratified samples of the population. Unlike nearly everything else in social science, IQ tests actually meet the basic assumptions of the statistical distributions they use. IQ tests predict things in the world so well because they are modeled from proper samples of that world. To many statisticians, IQ tests are pretty much the only thing that psychology does right. The statisticians have the frustration of a carpenter watching people hit screws with the wrong end of a hammer. But we don't need metaphors here. We have data. 
The bitch 100, for example, shows us it is not a fair test in its statistical properties alone. The white group's mean value is not the psychometric problem. The white group's different spread is. The test is not assessing the white subpopulation in the same way that it's assessing the black subpopulation. It's clearly not fair. And actual IQ tests took a few decades to solve this problem, but they did solve it. The tests similarly assess and differentiate between different subpopulations. That is, the tests are fair in terms of their properties. Next, let's support the claim that IQ tests are, despite a history of people misusing them, our least biased estimator of ability and potential at the results end. How do the results of their current use support the claim that they are our least biased option? First, they're the only objective way of defending those who do not understand things like the Charter Caution, the rights read when one is placed under arrest, from being legally disadvantaged by this lack of understanding. Imagine walking into a world where misunderstanding policies that are communicated in ways beyond your comprehension can lead to your being locked away in prison. You would wish for a justice system capable of recognizing your status and acting fairly in response to it. IQ scores are the best, if not the only, legally established tool for this. Okay, but what about where there appear to be better options? When schools are selecting students for the gifted class, the group differences in IQ would suggest that IQ is an unfair way to select students, right? First, there are different interpretations of what fair means, but second, under all of those interpretations of fair, IQ is, by results, our best tool for determining giftedness. From Card and Giuliano, 2016, U.S. school districts wanted to see more minority students in gifted programs. This is in grade three. They tried adding more individualized tests, and these did very little. They tried lowering the required threshold for minority students, one of the definitions of fair that we might use, having lower relative standards. This also did very little. Then they tried universal IQ screening, testing all students, not just those referred by teachers or their parents. This, quote, led to a 174% increase in the odds of being identified as gifted among all disadvantaged students. The answer to racism, sexism, classism, and prejudice based on language proficiency was not special treatment or different rules. It was, by results, more objective testing, more IQ tests. So moving from giftedness assessment to assessing change in ability, IQ tests, despite being great for these other things, are not ideal for assessing student improvement. So what should we use for that? What should we use to assess improvement of individual ability? What will tell us whether school is working? First, what do we want to measure? What will be in our ability bucket? It seems like students, instructors, parents, potential business partners, and employers all want to know about improvement in critical thinking, literacy, logic, and problem solving, complex reasoning, and writing skills. These are the socially relevant behaviors or constructs behind them that people want improved and assessed. Oftentimes they'll also tack on quantitative reasoning. So we make assessments that are lists of questions requiring you to apply reading skills, objective judgment, and reasoning. Not just confirmatory reasoning, integrative thinking that, while acknowledging multiplicity in the world, retains an ability to arrive at and support a conclusion. Do students get better at these things? Students seem to think so, reporting that their critical thinking, writing, and quantitative reasoning have improved, and instructors rank improving such abilities as the most important and essential goal of higher education. So is higher education improving critical thinking, complex reasoning, problem solving, and writing skills? Well. The first year of university is when modest improvement can be most expected, and the only year where studies tend to find improvement. Said again, results tell us to expect improvement in first year only, and only modest improvement. Okay, how modest? Expect to get almost 9% better at solving problems in your first year. For another non-Canadian but larger scale estimate of how modest an improvement to expect, let's look at the collegiate learning assessment results. Imagine you score in the exact middle of your first year cohort skills assessment on your first day of university. You are average amongst your fellow first years at the 50th percentile. 
You then experience three semesters, almost two years of university, and are asked to be the only second year student testing with the next round of first years. You had outperformed 50% of the first years when you were a first year. What percentage of first years will you outperform now that you're nearing the end of your second year? 57%. Switching to a familiar scale, this would translate to a 2.7 IQ point improvement, which is also what Stuart Ritchie's results would roughly predict. Since averages can be misleading when the spread of scores is neglected, these results can be put another way. 45% of students assessed either showed no gains or decrements in their critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing skills. The test that gave us these larger scale and likely very relevant and generalizable results, the CLA, is the best assessment tool we have for this job, and the only one that critics of assessment in general seem to support. Not just because of its results, which are quite impressive, but because of its format, which generally gives students some information and asks basic questions about this information to see whether students can not just find but comprehend and use and communicate their use of information. Accomplishing tasks or engaging in socially desired behaviors that are very concrete but that nonetheless require the necessarily more abstract desired abilities, namely critical thinking, literacy, comprehension, logic, problem solving, complex reasoning, quantitative reasoning, and writing. The CLA provides performance tasks, such as reviewing reports and statistics and occasionally evaluating, in one's own words, some specific argument that is made about the provided reports and statistics. Is your evaluation clear, accurate, and logically cohesive? Importantly, if you're to conclude that an argument or conclusion that you're asked to evaluate is wrong, do you make it clear, for example, how and based on what evidence, what elements in the reports and statistics, the conclusion being evaluated is wrong? This is the type of situation where experience writing in the third person and with objectivity is going to be beneficial to you. Other assessment tools show greater four-year gains. In the 1990s, the average student could expect to gain one half standard deviation in critical thinking performance, which would translate on the IQ scale to 7.5 IQ points. But these numbers are a bit outdated, and there's a catch that comes with these scores. This improvement is relative, so it is relevant here to know that nearly all of the students both started and remained below the established cutoffs for proficiency, or even the marginal or near proficiency. In all three things, these students reported that their college experience had taught them critical thinking, writing skills, and quantitative reasoning. For those keeping score, we can expect 45% of students to not improve in university and, if this table is still relevant, only 5% to go from not proficient to proficient. And this is just the most robust and respectable of the bad news. One does not have to look far to find studies showing zero improvement across four years on things like reasoning skills. And yes, on critical thinking in the first year of university. The results, all of them, show a clear reduction in gains across time. In other words, students are getting less out of university. Important here is the reminder or acknowledgement that students did used to get something. This study, for example, noted that students in the 60s could expect to improve their critical thinking in university by more than one standard deviation, the equivalent of 18 IQ points, with the low end of improvement being equivalent to 11 IQ points. The same assessment in 2011 showed an average improvement less than one third of that, equivalent to five IQ points, with the low end of improvement going below zero, meaning more than a fifth of students got worse at critical thinking in four years of university, and the best third of students in 2011 only improving as much as the worst third of students did 48 years earlier. Inserting the results from the 1990s here, there's a clear trend of students getting less from higher education, less of what nearly everyone wants, values, and expects out of a higher education. And no, we can't blame the internet, smartphones, or social media since the trend started decades before any of these existed. 
And if we decide at this point that there must be something wrong with the tests, since our mothers think we're smart, our professors are giving us A's, and companies are still hiring us, well, the professors giving most of their students A's are also stating that most of their students lack the basic skills required for learning the subject matter. The employers hiring graduates are not only complaining that the hired graduates don't have thinking skills, they're also giving up hope that they can get the level of competence that their company needs from them. They are hiring based on where the graduate would be least weak. So where writing is required, don't hire science majors. Where thinking or general knowledge is required, don't hire education majors. They're picking based on the least bad option. And when they're in doubt, they're just hiring from the old school humanities departments like philosophy, since at least those graduates can handle reading. Which incidentally might be why they're kicking the ass of more specialized disciplines on their own standardized assessments. And don't expect more than a quarter of graduates to have any of the things that university has promised that they will have. Especially not writing skills. Because we all know what happened to the judgment of those. The good news is that your mother is right. You are a genius and wonderful in ways that only you can be wonderful. Employers just lack the time and creativity to find any better signal than a university degree that you have intelligence, can put in the work required, and will conform enough to fit in with the company. Maybe, just maybe, we can find a better signal for these things than a university degree. And you can spend your time doing other things that might make your mother proud. But stay tuned, I am going to try to save your education. Or at least show you how you can save it yourself. Because you're not the hero you deserve, but you are the one you need right now.